1431, Joan of Arc was burned at the stake. Now history has gone on to remember Joan as a saint. And as one historian said, while Joan is remembered as a saint, there is a man who fought beside Joan who was also executed many years later, and he is remembered as a sinner. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Also, as always, a very, very, very special thank you to all of our patrons. If it was not up for you, we would not be able to do what we do. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today we are going to be talking about Jill de Ra. Before we get started in the story, yes, I know once again I am in a different location of my house. Since we've gotten this new camera, I am trying to experiment with different locations to see which background gives the best filming quality. I am considering getting an actual backdrop to put on a wall to make it possibly even better. But if you prefer the bookcase, the typical background, then just let me know. The only issue I'm having with the background of the bookcase is that this camera sets a little bit lower than the old camera, and so the backdrop is a little bit off from our earlier videos. But I would love to hear your opinion on what you prefer to see as a background. I also want to let you guys know that my friend Tom Sidney Bushnell or Tom Numbers from the Sight Club here on YouTube, the Gematria guy who's really good at numbers, who's on this channel quite a bit, he has now released a book, a workbook for people who want to learn how to read Gematria. I will have a link down in the description box below if you would like to purchase his workbook along with a link to his channel, his Patreon, and his email address if you have any questions for him. All right, let's get started. So Jill DeRay was executed in 1440 for murdering a bunch of kids, doing some adult stuff to children that I can't actually say on YouTube or this video will get censored, and participating in satanic rituals. But was Jill DeRay actually guilty of the crimes he was accused of? Some people, including the very famous Aleister Crawley, who is said to be the most evil man who ever lived, don't think he was guilty of these crimes. Jill de Ra was born around 1405 to a very wealthy French noble family. Now by 1415 or thereabouts, his mother and father passed away, and so Gilles de Ra and his younger brother were put into the care of his maternal grandfather, a man named Jean de Crun. Now once again, as I say with all of my videos with the French family or any places in France, I am not a French speaker, and I apologize if I am not saying these names phonetically correct. I listened to the names a bunch of times. A lot of people had different pr pronunciations of these names, so I am definitely trying my best. If I get them wrong, please forgive me. Now, in order to understand the life of Gilles de Ray, or Joan of Arc for that matter, or anybody living in France during this time period, we have to understand what was going on between England and France. England and France, through most of our modern history, have always kind of been at war with each other. This really started in 1066, when William the Conqueror came into the United Kingdom and conquered it, claiming this land for himself. William the Conqueror was from France. So of course, in the matter of kingdoms and what empire controls what land, this brought up a lot of issues moving forward into the royal lineage of both England and France. Not only were the rulers of both England and France pretty much cousins, they both intermarried with each other to try to form alliances and then break alliances and take land and give land and all sorts of really, really complicated family feuding. We saw a lot of family feuding in England when we talked about the War of the Roses, and I will connect or link that video down 
below. Well, in France, we are looking at what was called the Hundred Years' War. Although it was actually technically over a hundred years, it lasted from 1337 until 1453. And again, during the Hundred Years' War, it was a bunch of nobles and royals fighting over who ruled what landmass. Now again, this is super important for Gilles de Ra because he was born into a noble family. This means that he was possibly related to the royal family at some time and he had his family had a lot of authoritative power within the country of France, as did the nobles in England. And because this 100 years war was so intense, children, especially young boys born into noble families during this time, were not only educated in the typical educational stuff, but they were educated in combat, learning how to fight. So Gilles de Ra, from the time he was born, was trained to be a warrior, to try to protect the nobility of France and the power of France. Well, it turns out that Jill de Ra was really talented at combat. And this talent ended up making him one of the richest men in all of France and fighting beside Joan of Arc. You see, because the French family, royal family, and the English royal family were cousins, again, there was some complications in inheritance. And there was definitely a lot of complications with the presumptive King Charles VII of France. Charles VII of France was one of his father's, Charles VI, King of France, younger son. But a lot of his brothers, or all of his brothers, had literally died leaving no heirs, so the Dauphin, or the heir presumptive, of the French crown fell to Charles VII. But the problem was that King Charles VI Charles VII's father was not all there mentally. He had a lot of mental instabilities. In fact, Charles VI thought that he was made of glass and wouldn't let people touch him because he thought he would break like glass. Now we know that the royal families are oftentimes inbred and so sometimes we see these little hiccups in their genetic markers. Well, at some point, King Charles VI of France had a bit of a mental breakdown and all of a sudden believed that Charles VII was not actually his son and possibly the son of one of his wife's lovers. Anyway, because of that, Charles VI ended up leaving the crown of France in his will to Henry V of England and his heirs. To make matters worse, there were some nobles in the country of France that supported the idea of English occupation of their country. So all of a sudden, King Charles, or the not king yet, the son Charles VII, is now stripped of a lot of his inheritance, his land, his titles. He only now has a very small portion of the land in France, and thus enters Joan of Arc, who goes to war to free Orleans from the English occupation, therefore crowning King Charles as King Charles of all of France, basically ensuring that Charles would take back his territory that most likely was probably rightfully his, seeing that his father, King Charles VI, was unstable. Now, Gil de Rey was assigned to fight alongside Joan of Arc, and so he was also a national celebrity at this point, along with Joan, because he had done so much to service the crown of France. In 1425, Gildara was invited to come into Charles' royal court, which was quite an honor back then. And from the year 1427 to 1435, he was the commander of the French army. Now in 1429, that is when he fought alongside Joan of Arc, and the same year, 1429, he was given the prestigious honor of being the Marshal of France, which was an honor given to people who had shown a lot of valor and bravery on the battlefield for France and basically for the French royal family. Now 1429, again the same year as Joan of Arc and Gilles de Rey's victory on Orléans, 
Gilda Ray was given the honor of carrying the holy oil at Charles VII's coronation as the King of France. On top of that, Gilda Ray was married to another very powerful noblewoman in France. They had one daughter, a daughter named Maria. Now, of course, at this time, women could not actually inherit their estates. They could only inherit their inheritance through marriage. Once they were married, then they could, as a couple, inherit all the money, all the land that this noblewoman had gotten from her own family. So by 1429, things were looking really good for Gil de Rey. He was the super famous fighter from France. He was in favor of the king, and he was literally probably one of the most wealthy people in all of the land. However, things started to take a turn around 1431 when his Pierre, his colleague on the battlefield, Joan of Arc, was burned at the stake after she was captured by the English. By this point, Gilda Ray had also gathered a reputation for being quite a big spender. I heard one commentary channel on Gilda Ray say it's you know, he was super young at this point. It was almost like he now had all this money, and it's like when young kids are young 20 early 20s, mid 20s, early 30s, even get a hold of a large chunk of money. Sometimes they don't know how to manage their money and they start spending lavishly on stuff that isn't investments, right? It's like partying and crazy cars instead of being responsible with this money. Now again, Gilda Ray had his own money because he was a nobleman, but he, he'd also married into a very, very powerful family in Brittany. And so he was also using some of his wife's family's money as well because he could, because he was her husband. In 1432, Gilda Ray's grandfather, his maternal grandfather, the man who raised him, died. Now his grandfather was so upset with the way Gilda Ray was spending the money that he ended up leaving his sword and breastplate to Gilda Ray's younger brother, which was crazy because usually the oldest son was the one that inherited everything. But the grandfather knew that Gilda Ray would probably pawn off the sword and breastplate and he wanted to make sure it stayed in the family. And so he basically slapped Gilda Ray across the face by not leaving Gilda Ray these family heirlooms. In 1433, Gilda Ray was so desperate for even more money that he started selling off a lot of the land that he had inherited through his own family, through his wife's family, and also land that had been given to him by Charles VII as a reward for all of Gilda Ray's hard work. Two years later, in 1435, Gil de Ray withdrew himself from the military, and he decided that he was going to build a chapel, his own chapel, on one of his properties. Now, this was not uncommon at the time, apparently. Apparently, the noble people who didn't feel like getting up and going to Mass would have their own chapels built on their property so they could have private masses instead of, you know, being with the common folk or the peasants. He even decided that for his own chapel, he would have elaborate robes made specifically for people working in his chapel, which, from what I understand, was quite a slap across the face for the politics or the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. In that same year of 1435, his in-laws, the Duke of Brittany, were very concerned with his spending habits, so much so that they went to the Pope and begged the Pope not to allow the chapel to be consecrated and also went to Charles VII and asked Charles VII to do something to stop Gil de Rey's spending. Well, the Pope didn't do a whole lot in this matter, but Charles VII did. Charles VII made it so Gil de Rey could not sell any more land or get into contract with any more nobility in the area. And then the Duke of Brittany decided, his father-in-law, decided that he wanted to be appointed the guardian of Gil de Rey's finances. From what I understand, this is basically what we would call a conservatorship. 
basically what Britney Spears is going through right now. Gilda Ray was put into a conservatorship with his father-in-law, the Duke of Brittany. Now another reason why it was really important for the law of the land to step in, meaning the king, Charles VII, to step in, is because even though Gilda Ray was spending money like crazy, he was still rich enough to gather up his own army and fight against his in-laws. By his in-laws stepping in and taking over his finances, they not only were assured that he would stop this crazy amount of spending, and they could make sure he wouldn't, you know, gather up an army to then fight against them. Because remember, Gilda Ray not only was very wealthy and powerful within his nobility, but he was a hero, a national hero and celebrity of France because of all the fighting he had done with Joan of Arc earlier, ensuring that Charles VII remained the King of France and the King of England didn't also become the King of France, making all the French people English. Does that make sense? Well, at this point, the legend goes that in 1438, Gil de Rey became desperate, and so he sought out the priest, Estuje Blanchet, to find another priest who knew a thing or two about the occult. It is said that Gil de Rey was specifically looking for someone who understood alchemy and demon summoning. Now, if you're new to this channel, you might be wondering why Gil de Rey went to a priest to look for a satanic priest. But if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that in our discovery of black masses, that it is said that the Catholic priests, especially the Catholic priests of back then, were trained in demonic services as well. Well, it is said that Estuje Blanchette connected Gil de Rey to an Italian priest who was an alchemist and apparently a demon summoner named Francois Perletti. Now apparently Perletti already had some books that were like magic books. I, that's all the information said. They were just magic books. I don't know what was in these magic books. I didn't look into them. But apparently Gil de Ra ended up reading through some of Pirelli's magic books and decided to bring him on board to help him summon some demons to do his dirty work. It is interesting to note too that Pirelli was allegedly also Gil de Rey's lover. And for those who have been studying or learning about the occult that goes on in our world, you know that your priest being your lover is kind of important to these black masses so I don't know for sure if he was his lover but from all the information I've studied that would be a, a very 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 important footnote just to remember. So Francois Perletti started working with Gil de Rey and they tried to summon a demon in the lower level of one of de Rey's castles called Baron. Now apparently they worked for like three days and three nights in this castle and Baron would not appear and so Perletti told Gil de Rey that in order for the demon Baron to appear, Gil de Rey would have to participate in a sacrifice. One of a human kind. One of a human child kind. Now again, for those of us who have been looking into this cult, this Canaanite cult for a while now, we know that this is not uncommon. If you remember from our episode on Catherine de Medici, there were rumors that she was involved in this as well. And again, I will post a link to that video down in the description box below. We know from the Bible, from the book of Leviticus, they talk about these types of ceremonies done to Moloch all the time and we also know that this is currently being done in our world as well. Now during this time too it is important to remember that parents did not keep up with their children the way that 
parents do today, especially for the lower classes or the peasantry. A lot of times children would be hired by nobility to work in their houses and then the children would go live with the nobility, never seeing their mom or dad again. It was very common for kids to also go missing and run off. It was just very different times when it came to child rearing. So for a long time, if the stories of Gil de Rey are true, many of the missing children were not accounted for because they came from peasant families. Now whether Gil de Rey offered these families work for their child or whether the child just went missing, it didn't really matter because again, these were peasants. Now, according to Francois Perletti, who was apparently some master priest at demon summoning, not only did you have to give a human over to the demon, a human child, but it had to be done in a very specific way. Now, I'm going to give a trigger warning. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about what happened. I know that YouTube is very sensitive to certain words, but if this makes you uncomfortable, you might want to skip ahead a couple of minutes in the story. Now, what Perletti and Gil de Rey would do is they would get a child to come into their castle, mostly young boys, where they would offer them work or whatever to come into this nobleman's house. They would strip them naked and hang them upside down and pretty much terrorize them before taking them down and then decapitating them. It is said that Gilda Ray kept a collection of heads from all these children that he had used in his rituals to this demon that he called Baron. Now, no bodies were ever found when they charged Gilda Ray with these offenses, but it is said that he did burn the bodies and bury them when he was done using them. Now everything went to hell in a handbasket on May 15th of 1440. Gilda Ray got caught up in an incident where he tried to kidnap a clergyman. And at that point, an investigation started where it was found out that Gilda Ray was allegedly doing all these horrific things, these demonic horrific things. Things. Gil de Rey was arrested on the 15th of September in 1440 and interestingly enough he did admit to doing all this. In fact, he said that he started doing stuffed children around 1432. So again, this was around the time that his grandfather had passed away a year after his comrade in arms, Joan of Arc, had been burned at the stake as well. Now, it is believed that he killed between 100 and 150 children, but many people who believe he was guilty of these crimes claim that it was probably more around the lines of 600 kids. A lot of people believe that Gilda Ray is one of the first recorded serial killers of our time, our modern time, that is. On the 26th of October of 1440, Gil de Rey was executed for his crimes. He was hanged and burned at the same time, which was typical punishment for the said crimes. Now it is interesting because it is recorded that before his body was completely just ripped apart by the flames, it was cut down and handed over to four noble women so that he could have a Christian burial. And this has led people, historians and investigators, to be skeptical of his charges to begin with. A lot of people believe that Gil de Rey was such an issue for his father-in-law that this story was created around him so that his father-in-law could take control completely of Gil de Rey's property. Now, the reason why people were first skeptical of this and maybe believed that the Catholic Church in the area had been bought off and paid off to basically say that they found evidence that he was doing this is because of the Christian burial. If Gil de Rey was truly, truly guilty of his crimes, he would not have been allowed to have a Christian burial. So a lot of people are skeptical and think that the father-in-law was behind this the whole time, again, paying off the Catholic Church to go along with this. We also know that Aleister Crowley, as I said in the beginning, also believed that Gil de Rey was actually innocent 
of these crimes. And we know he is like the most wicked man to ever live. So I think that says a lot saying that he thought this guy was actually innocent. And in 1992, they held another trial with Gilda Ray and again found him innocent. Kind of like what they did with King Richard III in England and the boys in the tower. Later on, they held another trial saying that there's no evidence to actually prove that this person is guilty of these crimes. So what do you guys think? I, I'm pretty torn on this. I know that nobility throughout the ages have been guilty of participating in Canaanite or satanic ritual a B U S E. Like we know that now. We're awake now. We're red pilled. We we know exactly what's going on. However, maybe Gilderay was innocent of his crimes, and maybe his father-in-law, who probably knew a thing or two about demon summoning, created this whole story in order to take control of Gilderay's property. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. Also, let me know your opinions down in the comment box below about the backdrop. What kind of backdrop do you want to see on this channel? After all, this channel is for you. All right, you guys, I hope that you have a wonderful Friday and a great weekend ahead. I'm super excited. I've got Janine and Tom numbers both coming back on the channel later on today that that sh that episode will either air tonight or saturday morning depending on how long it takes me to edit and get it uploaded to you all but you guys had such a wonderful response to janine i absolutely absolutely love janine she is our anchor woman in our house i think she's one of the best readers i've ever 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 come across and of course tom is basically a wizard with numbers and his form of divination is numbers is Gemantria. And so with the two of them together, we always get a little bit more clarity on what's going on in the world around us. As always, if you would like to purchase our opening song, there is also a link down in the description box below. Thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing the opening song for us. And as always, thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video up and on the internet for you to watch. I will talk to you guys very soon. Bye.